This is Mark Bebar. Welcome to this session of the International Hydrofoil Society 50th Anniversary Virtual Conference and Celebration. This presentation will be covering U.S. Navy hydrofoil development over a number of decades from the 1950s to the 1980s. The outline uh, shown on this slide, and uh, especially for the interactive Zoom session, where time will be constrained, uh, depending on the questions, we can uh, zero in on specific portions of the presentation. The objectives shown in this slide are uh, to introduce you to hydrofoil development efforts over a number of years, which eventually led to a, a class of six uh, U.S. Navy hydrofoils, a PHM-1 class. Talk a little bit about hydrofoil systems and subsystems, hopefully get you interested in the technology and, and, and uh, perhaps most importantly encourage students, especially those interested in the STEM subject areas, to consider ship design as a career field. Why hydrofoils? Uh, you know, everybody likes to go fast in their car and, and boats and so forth. So there's been a lot of efforts to increase waterborne speed both for naval application as well as uh, recreational and other commercial applications, including high-speed ferries. There's a lot of different advanced uh, unconventional hull forms out there shown in this slide. Uh, this presentation will focus on, on hydrofoils. And uh, all of these uh, advanced vehicles uh, focus on, in one way or another, re uh, lifting or removing as much of the hull as possible from the sea surface both to uh, reduce friction and drag and also to uh, take the, uh, the hull out of the, uh, the wave effects on the surface. This slide, uh, specific on, on the hydrofoil technology, which I'll be talking about, and figure one on the left shows the two basic types of, of hydrofoil vehicles. On the left part of figure one, you see surface piercing foils. On the right, fully submerged. Surface piercing uh, is a little more basic technology, and you can see, imagine as a, a craft of that type pitches down in a seaway, more of the foil, the angled foil surface becomes immersed in the water, generates more lift, and restores the boat back to a normal flying height. Fully submerged, which is used for uh, naval applications, in particular, uh, much more stable and sophisticated requires an automatic control system to maintain a uh, clear height between the bottom of the hull and the sea surface, and also uh, achieving much lower motions and accelerations due to the fact that the only parts of the craft intersecting the water at high speeds are these slender vertical struts with uh, very little wave action impacting those. Figure two shows uh, various schemes for lift distribution on hydrofoils. Uh, top conventional airplane configuration has most of the lift forward, canard in the middle of the figure, uh, most of the lift centered back aft on the, on the vessel, and tandem a more equal split between forward and aft. And a lot of you are familiar with America's Cup uh, back several years ago, and a very impressive competition and speeds on these uh, catamarans uh, lifted out of the water using hydrofoil speeds upwards of 45 knots. Fundamentals of hydrofoils, uh, they behave like wings on an aircraft following the Bernoulli principle in fluid dynamics where air, in the case of airplanes, or water for uh, hydrofoils flowing over the upper surface has to move faster to maintain continuity with fluid uh, moving underneath the foil. Because it has to travel a little bit further going over the top of the, uh, of the hydrofoil, it creates a, a low, low pressure due to the, the higher speed requirement, lower pressure, high pressure on the bottom surface, and the net effect is to create vertical lift. Part one of the presentation will cover a number of experimental hydrofoils. Back in the early 50s, the Office of Naval Research uh, contracted with a company called Baker Manufacturing. They built two 24-foot uh, craft, high pockets and high tail. The lower left is high pockets, which you can see has uh, surface piercing foils, and embarked the uh, Chief of Naval Operations at that time in the summer of 53. The lower right 
is high tail. This one uses, utilizes fully submerged foil systems, propeller drive, and an automatic control system to maintain uh, height. And you can see from the beginning in the early 50s, the intent was to be able to compare these two uh, inherently different types of uh, foil systems. A number of uh, amphibious hydrofoils were explored in the late 50s, starting in the late 50s. The Halibates on top achieved speeds of 34 knots and five foot waves. They upgraded the propulsion system with uh, a thousand horsepower gas turbine. A little later on, uh, better electronics for automatic control modified the foil system. And you can see in the uh, uh, lower figure, the right hand side, uh, quite elaborate mechanical scheme for being able to uh, both remove the, the aft foil system from the, uh, from the water, uh, be able to rotate it for steering, and maintain it uh, when it was taken out of the water. This slide shows a couple of different amphibious hydrofoils, the uh, LCVPH built by Baker. They took an existing landing craft and modified it similar to the high pockets you showed in the previous slide utilizing surface piercing foils and were able to achieve speeds to the beach of about 40 knots. In the bottom you see an Army landing craft, the DUKW, the contract given to Miami Shipbuilding and AFCO, which is an uh, engine company, to demonstrate a flying landing craft, utilize a gas turbine, in this case submerged, fully submerged foils, and a dramatic increase in speed from the uh, non-modified craft going from 5 knots up to 30 knots. The Marine Corps built a couple of craft called LVHX. They were interested in hydrofoils being added to uh, wheeled amphibians. And there were two competing designs, the Dash 1 built by AFCO Lycoming and the Dash 2 by FMC to the same set of requirements, including a five-ton payload and a speed of 35 knots. The uh, Dash 1 had submerged foils and the Dash 2 surface piercing. So once again, uh, continuing the theme of comparing these two basic types of foil systems. The program went ahead, uh, but it was deemed uh, too complex and too costly to pursue this further, and so that program was terminated before any production craft were modified. The Carl Hydrofoil, in this case, is a little different using air screw propellers. Uh, quite a large craft, 53 feet, operated uh, up in the uh, uh, northeast of the country. A seaplane type hull that you can see in the figure, single strut and foil aft, about 900 horsepower. Uh, the trials were conducted in 1953, and the craft was able to achieve a speed of over uh, 74 miles an hour eventually, which exceeded a, a record set by Alexander Graham Bell uh, back in 1919. So th these were very impressive speeds uh, for the Carl XCH4. And it basically uh, convinced the Navy to continue hydrofoil development. Part two of the presentation will cover R&D and operational hydrofoils between the late 50s and 1980s. This chart kind of gives you an overview uh, showing uh, ship size and, and displacement in tons along the vertical axis and the years along the bottom. And I'll be talking about most of these. Uh, key takeaway is the PHM you see in the uh, towards the right near the top, uh, a class of six ships built. And then the largest Navy R&D hydrofoil up at the top was Plainview in excess of 300 tons. Sea legs, uh, in the late 1950s, 1957, it was a, a existing pleasure craft, a Chris Craft hull modified to a Gibson Cox Navy design, a little over five tons in displacement. It showed excellent sea keeping and performance. You can see the fully submerged foil systems with an inclined shaft to propellers, uh, a propeller back aft for propulsion. They did uh, demo flights in DC in July 1958 with the uh, CNO at the time, Admiral Burke, on board. David Taylor Research uh, conducted a trials program, developed design data and criteria for hydrofoils that were to follow. And the boat was retired with honors in uh, 1975 in, at the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia. The Denison, built a little later on, launched in 1962 up in Long Island, New York. 
Uh, this one with surface piercing foils, you can see them uh, when the boat is flying and also with the forward system visible on the lower right in a retracted position. Over 100 feet long, uh, just under 80 tons displaced, very impressive speeds of 50 to 60 knots. And with uh, a high level of stability, maneuverability, and performance in rough water. And a lot of the uh, technologies used here in terms of hydrodynamic design of the struts and foils and propulsion power levels uh, established a, a stronger database to continue further Navy hydrofoil development. Fresh One was a one off, a, a sh very short lived effort to look at much higher speeds, uh, in excess 70 knots and slightly higher. Uh, there was an interest in exploring this because there was a, a body of opinion that hydrofoils of these much higher speeds might be useful in certain applications. Requires a different approach to foil section shape, super cavitating foils. And you can see here that this craft uses a, a gas turbine propulsor on top, pure thrust, in, uh, to drive the craft at those speeds. Unfortunately, it capsized at high speed. Uh, luckily, the uh, two operators were not injured too badly, but based on that, it was decided not to pursue any further. The High Point delivered to the Navy in early uh, August 1963, named after the High Point, North Carolina. Uh, over 116 feet long, 125 tons. This was a Navy designed Bureau of Ships built by Boeing. It's powered by two British Rolls-Royce gas turbines, about 6,300 horsepower total. Uh, through those after struts, through right angle drives, and four propellers, two per side. There were major mods conducted in 71 to improve various areas of the design, steering, the hydraulics, uh, redefinition of the propulsion pods to get better inflow to those tractor, uh, tractor propellers. Two propellers per side, uh, reconfiguring re, uh, the gears for foil borne propulsion and so forth. In April 1975, the Coast Guard took it over for a period of time to evaluate it potentially as a, a U.S. Coast Guard cutter. They were interested in higher speeds at that time, and here you see the high point painted Coast Guard colors. It was decommissioned in 1989, eventually. Uh, wound up being purchased by a collector, Terry Orm, who uh, got the boat just before it was scrapped in 2005. Terry and a lot of volunteers spent quite a few years uh, restoring the ship and trying to get it to operate in a Holborn mode. Uh, within the last few years, that effort has run out of steam, and uh, High Point is currently offered for sale at about $45,000. I had the opportunity to visit the ship in 2012 and uh, quite interesting to see all the hard work Terry and his volunteers had put in at that time. Little Squirt, another one off. Uh, this primarily to explore uh, water jet propulsion in the uh, mid 60s and uh, various uh, refinements were done, automatic control system and acoustic height center, sensor to uh, maintain that flying height. It's currently lo located at a museum at out in Gasconade, Missouri with the PHM-5, which I'll talk about in a separate presentation. There's also going to be a presentation walkthrough of that museum by Elliot James in a separate, separate presentation during the celebration. In the uh, mid to late 60s, the Navy embarked on what was potentially going to be a, a class of hydrofoil gunboats. Two were built, PGH-1. Uh, propeller driven with an airplane or conventional foil configuration built by Grumman, PGH2, water jet, and canard. So, again, kind of diametrically opposed configurations here and different propulsion schemes. They were delivered at a, uh, basically the same time frame in 68 and sent over to Vietnam to do uh, real world operations during the Vietnam conflict. This slide has the characteristics of the flagstaff. Just under 70 tons, 50 knot speeds, a crew of 13 people. This slide shows the flagstaff over in Vietnam at the pier in Da Nang uh, with logistic support vans on the pier. Uh, the operations were very successful, uh, good level of operability in adverse conditions of waves, humidity, and high temperatures.
So you can carry, built by Boeing, as I mentioned, delivered at a cost of about $4 million, which is similar to the cost of the Flagstaff. Just under 60 tons, uh, 50 knot speed, uh, same size crew, and operated alongside uh, Flagstaff in Vietnam. There'll be uh, several presentations, uh, separate presentations on the PGH-2 uh, during this 50th anniversary event. Well, following the mission in Vietnam, Tucum Carry tri was transported to Europe and uh, was used for demonstrations over there and combat exercises, uh, basically to show the uh, various NATO countries who were interested in, in high-speed patrol vessels for uh, countering the Soviet threat in that time, uh, what hydrofoil technology was capable of. Uh, quite successful operations in, uh, over in Europe. Uh, then the, the ABO was assigned to the Atlantic Fleet. Unfortunately, ran into a reef in the fall of 72, quite heavily damaged. It uh, was salvaged, transported to Norfolk, but due to the cost involved, was not restored. The key takeaway point for Tucum Carry was it established uh, the basic foil design philosophy that was used later on the PHM canard foil configuration, fully submerged. A gas turbine water jet for uh, whole borne propulsion, uh, foil borne propulsion, and whole borne propulsion. The last uh, craft I'm going to talk about is the Plain View, uh, designed by Grumman, built by Lockheed, delivered in, uh, and launched in June of '65. Uh, in excess of 300 tons, over 200 feet long, uh, was capable of speeds of over 50 knots with two gas turbines that's about 30,000 horsepower total with space and weight reservations to add two more gas turbines in the future and achieve much higher speeds up 60 to 70 knots for super cavitating operations. That, that later development did not occur and Plainview operated through its fairly short life with uh, the plant described on this slide. And here you see the airplane configuration with uh, the larger foils just forward amidships. Uh, the bow kind of cantilevered out there and uh, basically a, a quite dramatic foil system configuration. Uh, had its first flight March of 68, uh, started preliminary acceptance trials in February 69, operated by the Hydrofoil Special Trials Unit out in Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. The Navy undertook its own program of deficiency correction in order to make the ship operational uh, in a number of technical areas. Uh, final contract trials in January 70, and the Navy accepted the ship in March of that year. A lot of unique characteristics and technologies, uh, some of which caused issues. It was a very large ship. Uh, wasn't exceeded until the Soviet Union built the Babushka hydrofoil in the 1970s. Very large aluminum hull. Uh, subcavitating foil systems, but very high structural loadings on that structure uh, to enable foil system sizes that were compatible with operations in, in and out of harbors and piers. A very large hydraulic system, pressures of over 3,600 psi, a number of uh, hydraulic pumps, uh, very high capacity and flow rate, 1,000 gallons per minute. A right angle drive transmission system, 15,000 horsepower per side with super capitating propellers and high rotational speeds. Because of its size and strut dimensions, the plane view would, could operate with uh, no adverse effect on performance through 10 foot waves. The ship conducted a number of mission trials that are delineated on the top of the slide, but eventually uh, budget considerations and the R&D uh, lines of funding resulted in cuts. The last foilborne flight in July of 78. And unfortunately, because of the decision not to add more horsepower and continue operations, the plain view was never really tested to, to her full inherent capability. The ship was inactivated in September 78, sold to a private party. But unfortunately, uh, that person ran out of funding and uh, abandoned the, uh, the, uh, the hull. And it's uh, sitting on a mud flat out near Astoria, Oregon, which is a, kind of a sad conclusion to the plain view. 
that concludes the, the main body of the presentation. Uh, this slide shows a, uh, an overview of hydrofoil video, somewhat dated, but gives you a good feel for hydrofoil ships operating at sea. And to acknowledge that a, a lot of the material from this presentation came from John Meyer's book. John Meyer was a past president of the International Hydrofoil Society, has passed away uh, several years ago. Uh, I was a protege of John's, and uh, John was an incredible guy, lived and breathed hydrofoils, and this was a book that he prepared in 1990. Uh, with that, during the Zoom live, live session, I'll uh, take questions at this point.